it's a real pleasure uh, to have Dr. Hoffman with us here. A Time of Terror, the Middle East and the Future of Terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pressman, for that extremely kind introduction. Uh, Thank you, Professor, Professor Ashkenazi, for the very kind uh, invitation to address you all tonight uh, in the Koryansky lecture. It's very nice when you're introduced and someone talks about your books. Um, this is just out today, so if you're looking for a really <laughs> scary Halloween gift, this is the perfect <laughs> one, The Evolution of the Global Terrorist Threat. I just have this advanced copy, uh, which I'm actually bringing to my mother this evening. Um, but, and that book, I think, will put in perspective what I'm going to speak with you tonight about. In fact, this book, uh, obviously, I f it was finished uh, a year ago, but, a sure, backs up right into, right into um, the issues that I will discuss um, tonight. I think that beyond any doubt, the Syrian civil war has reversed al-Qaeda's waning fortunes and not least has also produced the terrorist group variously known as the Islamic State, uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, or the Islamic State of Syria and the Levant, um, which I'll call ISIS. Two, even three years ago, the jihadi movement championed by al-Qaeda appeared to be in, de in terminal decline. Its founder and leader was dead, its chief radicalizer, Anwar al-Awlaki, had been killed only months later. As a result of the stepped-up U.S. drone campaign in South Asia and Yemen since 2009, at least three dozen of al-Qaeda's senior leadership had been killed and over 200 of its fighters eliminated. Many thought that al-Qaeda had ceased to become relevant, especially in the Middle East. And in fact, one saw that al-Qaeda was largely inactive during the transformative events that swept across North Africa and the Middle East, known as the Arab Spring. Many observers consequently argued that civil protests, civil disobedience, had nonviolence had achieved what the terrorists had manifestly failed to deliver. That al-Qaeda's killing of Muslims had largely alienated its base, its core constituency. That al-Qaeda had also lost the struggle for Muslim hearts and minds and the so-called war of ideas. And in fact, that the longing for democracy and economic reform had once and for all trumped repression and violence. Consequently, we were repeatedly assured by some of the most senior intelligence officials in the United States, by even the president and our highest elected officials, that al-Qaeda was on the quote-unquote verge of strategic collapse. How different it all looks today. First, core al-Qaeda is, is present in more countries today or more places today than it's ever been before. In fact, at this moment, al-Qaeda operates at least 17 major networks or has a presence in 17 countries throughout the world. This is nothing short of astonishing. Think about this. In more than six years, or actually I should say in a little less than six years, Al-Qaeda has more than doubled its presence throughout the world. Now, put that in to put that in perspective, think of what the world's been going through the past six years rather than tremendous expansion, we've actually witnessed a period of tremendous economic decline, or at least of constriction. We've seen our bureaucracies and our military services shed rather than add personnel. We've seen the U.S. intelligence community and federal law enforcement being asked to do more with fewer resources. In fact, we're slated to have the smallest peacetime army since the end of World War II. And just last May, on top of those already existing cuts, it was announced that another 10,000 personnel would leave the U.S. Army by the end of this year, and that there would be additional cuts next year of a further 20,000 personnel. Now, to put that in perspective, according to very well-respected uh, non-governmental organization that monitors conflict in Syria, in July alone, ISIS added 6,000 new fighters. So we're declining and constricting, unfortunately, al-Qaeda and associated jihadi movements are growing. 
And I'll talk about this in a second. Recently, we have the addition of yet another Al-Qaeda affiliate or associate uh, Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. Second, as if this development weren't bad enough, we have the even more worrisome emergence of ISIS. Third, the jihadi message, whether coming from Al-Qaeda or from ISIS, still, 13 years after the 9-11 attacks, remains compelling and just as troubling, both the Al-Qaeda brand and the ISIS brand are both flourishing. Their increasing messaging on sectarian attacks, on the importance of mobilizing and taking part in the age-old struggle of Arab against Persian, of Sunni against Shia, has struck a responsive chord throughout the region. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, Kik, and so on, underpins, facilitates, and encourages this development. And it's served as the single most important generator of foreign fighters in recent decades. Today, according to one respected estimate, foreign fighters hailing from at least 80 different countries are fighting in Syria and Iraq. I mean, think about that. 80 different countries, that's a third of the world's countries, have contributed fighters uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the conflicts in those two countries. These two developments, the reliance on sectarian messaging and on sectarian, the continuance of sectarian conflict, and the power of social media ensure both the resilience and the continued attraction of both Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And fourth, we see that we're very much in a very fluid, in fact, a highly fluid and enormously complicated environment. The threat has grown overall, at least in my estimation or assessment, while at the same time, our resources, as I just said, have contracted, especially as a result of sequestration, and even diminished as a result of the cutbacks. In other words, we have fewer resources to bring to the struggle against terrorism than at any time in the, per the past uh, 13 years. Why are these groups such a threat? Well, firstly, let's focus on ISIS for a moment. ISIS has fundamentally achieved what bin Laden only promised and had always failed to, to deliver. In fact, ISIS is, has achieved what no other nation state in the Middle East has been able to do, accomplish since the end of World War I, and that is to redraw the map of the region. In this respect, the threat that ISIS presents is neither local nor are its aims parochial. The ISIS plague will spread in the first instance beyond Syria and Iraq to Lebanon, as it is already doing, it will target Jordan, and thenceforth move to Libya, Tunisia, the Sinai, and Israel. Now, this isn't something that I'm predicting, or necessarily something that is part of a prognostication. This is called from ISIS's own statements. ISIS's own aims and strategies talks about those countries, Lebanon, Jordan, Libya, Tunisia, the Sinai, and Israel as being very firmly within its sights. I mean, interestingly, although ISIS was expelled from Al-Qaeda last January, it still has, despite this rivalry, enormous respect for its parent organization. And in its propaganda, leaves countries uh, such as Egypt, uh, Morocco, the Sahel, East Africa, South Asia, elsewhere to Al-Qaeda and says, we will divide up this struggle and we will focus first and foremost on Syria and Iraq, and once we achieve success there, we'll move further southward and then uh, westward. In that sense, I think, not only are ISIS's aims neither local nor its objectives parochial, but I don't believe that the threat will remain confined to the Levant and Mesopotamia alone. Uh, firstly, the United States, of course, has now firmly within ISIS's sights as a result of even our very limited intervention in both Iraq and Syria. Even before the intervention, ISIS was already rallying against the United States and Western democracy and seeking to eviscerate the influence of both from the Middle East. But I think more importantly, what we see is that ISIS, at least in my view, faithfully apes and even attempts to better Al-Qaeda. In other words, even though it's been expelled from the Al-Qaeda group, it still very much follows an Al-Qaeda game plan or Al-Qaeda blueprint. In ISIS's propaganda, it still speaks glowingly 
even lovingly, with tremendous respect for Osama bin Laden, but promises they will deliver on all the promises that bin Laden had failed uh, to produce. In this sense, if we look back over the past six years, and I described this doubling of al-Qaeda's presence, this has largely been facilitated by the growth, growth of al-Qaeda franchises, of affiliates and associates throughout the Middle East, North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, and South Asia. And this is something that has really, I think, transformed al-Qaeda's ability to survive or withstand even the most consequential countermeasures ever directed against a terrorist group in history. And this was the United States-led war on terrorism. But the franchises have given al-Qaeda precisely the resiliency and the longevity that enables it to still present a threat today. And what's interesting about these affiliates and associates is that al-Qaeda didn't create hardly any of them. The, the only one it really created is the, is the most recent one, al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. All the others, Boko Haram, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, al-Shabaab, Lashkari Taiba, the list goes on. These were all independent jihadi organizations that were self-created, that emerged on their own, that were independent, but over time of their own volition chose to ally or associate themselves with al-Qaeda. And this has given al-Qaeda, through these proxies in essence, if not a global reach, but certainly a reach across multiple regions. In my assessment, I think it's just a matter of time before we start to see franchises emerging. Independent terrorist groups similarly proclaiming their alliance or affinity or fidelity to ISIS. And this will have an equally transformative impact on ISIS, which will similarly give it the power to reach across regions and to operate on a much broader canvas than just the Levant and Mesopotamia. And then the fact, of course, that it's able to draw foreign fighters from at least 80 countries throughout the world potentially gives it almost unparalleled or certainly unprecedented international reach. So therefore, in my view, ISIS is almost an al-Qaeda on steroids. It's the uber al-Qaeda. Um, it has money and armaments that the core al-Qaeda could only dream of. Uh, not only is it acquired tens of millions of dollars through kidnapping and extortion, but uniquely in the history of terrorism, ISIS has renewable economic resources that it can depend on. And this is its control over oil fields and national gas fields that it's able to market on the black and gray, on the, that it's able to sell on the black and gray markets and therefore uh, derive a steady um, income stream. It also has an unprecedented amount of armaments. According to some estimates, it seized at minimum three divisions worth of arms from the Iraq security forces, basically US arms that were given to the Iraqi security forces. In fact, in ISIS propaganda, they regularly boast, come and fight us. We're very happy to fight you with the arms that you have provided. These include tanks, artillery pieces, surface air missiles, uh, plastic explosives, Humvees, uh, a whole panoply, enough literally to outfit um, an army. ISIS also has an identical ideology to al-Qaeda. The only difference is that if this is even possible, uh, it's more ruthlessly and zealously applied. In many respects, the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in my view, is almost a 21st century incarnation of Pol Pot. Someone who has gathered around him a cult of a personality, who has declared himself caliph, and who has waged an unmitigated campaign of violence and bloodshed against ISIS's sectarian enemies. Not just against the Shia, but also against the Yazidis, a minority, the Alawites, and also Christians. So what we see is the same ideology, but more viciously and more faithfully and zealously applied. Also, what's particularly worrisome is that ISIS has shown itself to be a learning organization. It doesn't stumble into committing the same mistakes that either al-Qaeda perpetrated in the past or even its predecessor organizations were responsible for. For example, al-Qaeda in Iraq, which eventually grew into ISIS, um, had alienated its own constituencies in western Iraq uh, during the period of the Iraq War. Um, its ruthless suppression of the population, its enforcement of Sharia and Islamic rule had turned the population against it and 
permitted things like the Anbar Awakening. Uh, ISIS has been very careful to avoid making the same mistakes. Certainly having a surfeit of funds to disperse, to co-opt and suborn, to win people's loyalty has certainly helped it. But it's engaged to an extent that was unimaginable for Al-Qaeda in what we might call social welfare activities. Uh, sending police into the markets and bazaars to basically police food stands and ensure that the produce is fresh and that the meat isn't uh, rancid. Um, sending quote-unquote night watchmen into the communities to provide a layer of security and law enforcement that hitherto hadn't um, existed. So in this sense, it's very clever. It attempts to win its friends over to it and treats its enemies extremely harshly. Its success the past few months, I would argue, was predicated very much on a, strat a very sophisticated strategy of subversion as well as military conquest. And the weeks and months preceding ISIS's invasion of Iraq. It sent emissaries, agents, and operatives into western Iraq, into Anbar province and elsewhere, where it engaged in a systematic campaign of co-option and subversion. In fact, it was the ultimate fifth column, winning over support from Sunnis who had felt oppressed by the Shia, distributing bribes and money where it could help to solidify its presence, and therefore creating the groundwork that facilitated its lightning thrust into, um, into Iraq. So what we have, in essence, is almost an Islamic replay of the 1959 Cuban Revolution, but at warp speed. If you remember, Fidel Castro and the 26th of July movement emerged from the mountains in western Cuba, converging on the capital of Havana in a march and in a struggle that took him two years to achieve before he approached the gates of Havana and overthrew the, cap the capital. ISIS has achieved the same thing, moving to the gates or the suburbs of Baghdad in less than two months. Also, too, we see that ISIS is extremely adept at both using social media and also exploiting traditional media. Uh, in fact, we saw an example of this yesterday where the British uh, hostage um, was seen giving a walking tour of Kobani, uh, the besieged uh, Kurdish um, uh, Kurdish enclave in Syria, where in very sophisticated, almost like the type of footage that we see in Western news broadcasts, um, this, 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 this poor captive, who himself was a journalist, was forced to conduct a tour of ISIS's presence um, in this um, stronghold. So we see a group that has learned from the mistakes of both its predecessors and from other terrorist groups, and has become much more effective um, in terms of establishing its rule and perpetrating its reign of terror. In this respect, I think one has to say, too, moving to al-Qaeda, that the conventional wisdom about al-Qaeda has almost never been right, and it's even less correct today. If al-Qaeda had been so degraded in recent years, if it was on the verge of strategic collapse, as we were repeatedly told, how does one explain the deliberate movement of senior al-Qaeda leaders to key conflict zones such as Yemen, Somalia, North Africa, and now Syria in recent years. Somalia is a classic case in point which illustrates Al-Qaeda's own, com own campaign or own policy of plussing up or strengthening the capabilities of local allies and affiliates. For instance, two senior members of the Al-Qaeda leadership, uh, Saleh al nabhan and someone went by the nom de guerre, Fazul, were dispatched to build up al-Shabaab's capabilities in East Africa, and it's not surprising that shortly afterwards, al-Shabaab engaged in its first suicide attacks, uh, particularly against uh, United Nations forces and also against invading Ethiopian troops. Fortunately, both Fazul and Salih Nabhan were killed. Uh, Salih Nabhan in a U.S. Uh, Navy SEAL operation in 2009. Fazul when he blundered into a checkpoint, so they've been eliminated, but they're by no means alone or isolated. Now, in recent weeks, you may have heard of uh, news reports of the so-called Khorasan group active in Syria, uh, where attacks were directed against a Khorasan group um, stronghold. This is exactly the contemporary exemplar of this process of al-Qaeda's senior leadership knowingly sending its top commanders to other regions of conflict to train up, to build, to enhance their local allies. And the Khorasan group, which is drawn of the highest echelon of al-Qaeda, was dispatched to Syria 
with a twofold mission. Firstly, to build up the strength of Jabhat al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda affiliate or associate uh, in Syria, but also to establish a base of operations there that would enable al-Qaeda to project, project power outside of its headquarters in South Asia. Secondly, core al-Qaeda, in my analysis, has always had a much deeper bench than we've always believed. Even today, there were individuals at the highest echelon of al-Qaeda who are by no means household names, but nonetheless themselves have upwards of three decades combat experience, fighting firstly against the Soviets or the Red Army in Afghanistan in the 1980s, subsequently against the Afghan government in the 1990s, and then against the United States and our coalition partners in Afghanistan in the early part of, of, of this century. And al-Qaeda has demonstrated an enormous ability to backfill and to compensate for even the leaders that we've been able to eliminate over the past five years as part of the drone campaign. And in this respect, we see that al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, despite the claims of many observers, was not a publicity stunt, was not a desperate bit of al-Qaeda embraced a couple of months ago to attempt to gain ground against ISIS or to elbow its way uh, into the limelight. Firstly, if you studied closely or listened to the statement that Ayman al-Zawahiri, the leader of al-Qaeda, issued, he said that the creation of al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent was two years in the making, which conforms very much to al-Qaeda's age-old preference and dependence, really, on more than a modicum, on a dedication to patiently building the foundation or the framework of all of its um, ventures. Significantly, too, in recent years, al-Qaeda has focused more and more of its attention on South Asia, in their view, at least, as a lucrative battlefield. Last January, for example, when al-Qaeda's followers throughout the world were anticipating a statement from Ayman al-Zawahiri to explain ISIS's expulsion from al-Qaeda, the split that had <coughs> riven the jihadi movement, Zawahiri did something completely outside everyone's expectations. His first statement of our new year didn't focus on Syria, didn't concern itself with the Levant, but actually was a statement declaring al-Qaeda's interest in furthering its organizational capabilities and spreading its influence throughout South Asia. In fact, the focus of that January speech was not on Syria, but in fact on Bangladesh, a country where al-Qaeda has traditionally not been terribly active. Also, in announcing the creation of al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, Zawahiri first named a dozen martyrs to the cause, heroes of this terrorist campaign. Without exception, all of them were Pakistani nationals, Pakistanis that had fought with al-Qaeda, including two of the best known, uh, Rashid Rauf, uh, a British Muslim of Pakistani extraction who was actually killed in a drone attack in 2009, and Ilias Kashmiri, um, another senior al-Qaeda leader who had been a colonel, actually, sorry, a major in the Pakistani army, uh, who, had also been, who was also killed in a U.S. drone attack uh, the following year. In fact, over the past two years, al-Sahab, the clouds, al-Qaeda's perennially active media arm, has released more videotapes and more statements in Urdu, the language of Pakistan, than in Arabic as it deliberately attempts to recreate the movement, not with the Arab face it always had, but rather with a South Asian complexion. This dovetails with the increasing attention that al-Qaeda has paid in the last year to the small Muslim communities in Burma and the Maldives, two other countries where al-Qaeda traditionally had no interest, and also, I would argue worrisomely, to the reinvigoration of al-Qaeda activities in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And this, in and of itself, is highly significant because it was in those three countries in particular that we arguably, the world community, had scored the greatest success against al-Qaeda in completely dismantling the group that was known as Jamaa Islamiya at the beginning of the last decade. That was the one place where we thought we had really stomped on and had completely eliminated the al-Qaeda threat. Yet we see it reviving in these countries as well. Also, the meme or the buzz in Washington this past spring uh, amongst government officials was that the split between al-Qaeda and ISIS, 
would actually achieve the fight, would deliver the final blow, would sound the death knell in the existence of both groups. The hope was, in fact, that this rivalry would weaken the movement overall, would set in motion fratricidal bloodshed or internecine bloodletting that would eventually result in the destruction of both groups. Yet this was a fundamental misreading of the history of terrorism over at least the past five decades. Because in contrast, what we've seen in the past half century is that splits in terrorist organizations, at least in the short term, have not resulted in both the new splinter and the parent organization weakening and withering away in the vine or consuming one another in some desperate bid of self-immolation. Rather, what we've seen repeatedly, whether it's in Palestine, whether it was in Algeria, whether it was even in Ireland as well, is that rivalries within a terrorist movement has led to an escalation in violence as both the offspring competes with the parent organization for not only attention and publicity, but for new recruits and for finances, thus locking both groups into an upward spiral. And I would argue we've already seen this in the case of ISIS, because in the aftermath of its expulsion from, from Al-Qaeda, it resolved to project its power into Iraq to better Al-Qaeda, again, to deliver what Bin Laden promised could only be achieved when the West was defeated, and that was the resurrection of the caliphate. The result may be the emergence not of two weakened factions, but rather of two stronger, more resilient forces, with both targeting the United States and the West as part of that competition. Also, too, as unlikely as it may seem right now, we shouldn't rule out the possibility of a potential reconciliation or reunification or reamalgamation of ISIS and Al Qaeda. Firstly, on both sides, efforts are ongoing to achieve some form of modus vivendi or some form of cooperation. Um, in fact, very recently, ISIS uh, released some 50 Jabhat al Nusra prisoners that it was holding as a gesture of goodwill. Um, Zawahiri himself has sent emissaries with overtures to try to rebuild their shattered relationship. And it seems ironically that the, probably the greatest prospect for achieving this reunification would be the death of al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing against killing uh, Baghdadi. I think that his, his elimination would be a, a boon for humanity and for civilization. But at the same time, we have to bear in mind that one of the reasons for the split is, the egoma is his egomania, his almost unbridled, as I described, cult of personality that has set him on a collision course with al-Zawahiri, who sees himself as the leader of the jihadi movement, that has resulted in a very intense personal enmity. So I almost think that if al-Baghdadi was somehow eliminated or left the scene, the, the road would be paved for this reconciliation, which would produce two very powerful threats of almost epic or unparalleled uh, proportions. So I think what all this suggests is that Al-Qaeda, one has to admit even ISIS, actually thinks strategically, as painful as that may be for us to admit. And we know this. We know this from a 2005 document that Al-Qaeda released that laid out almost a decade ago its so-called or self-proclaimed five-stage strategy to victory, a strategy that I have to say that ISIS has today hijacked or adopted for its own. The first phase of the strategy was called the awakening stage. Uh, this lasted from 2000 to 2003 and coincided with the 9-11 attacks. In Al-Qaeda's propaganda, this stage was designed, quote unquote, to reawaken the nation by dealing a powerful blow to the head of the snake in the United States. Okay, you can check that off. They succeeded there. The second phase, or the second stage, they described as the eye-opening stage. And that unfolded after the United States' invasion of Iraq and lasted, in essence, from 2003 to 2006. And here, the purpose of this um, eye-opening stage was to perpetually enmesh the United States and the West in a series of en enervating, debilitating, bankrupting overseas military expeditions. 
check that off. From their point of view, they achieve that as well. And I think this is the important thing. I mean, a lot of this is in the realm of fantasy, but that's the point about propaganda. Propaganda doesn't have to be true. It just has to be believed. It has to have a thread or a tr kernel of truth that the propagandists can exploit, which both ISIS and Al-Qaeda are doing now. The third phase was described as the rising up and the standing on the feet stage and was and lasted from 2007 to 2010. And this entailed the proactive expansion of Al-Qaeda to new venues, the seeking out of new opportunities to grow, as we've seen has occurred, especially in West Africa and the Levant. And here I think this is very important that this, as I said, a lot of this is fantasy, a lot of this fortunately is more in the half-baked than in the fully-baked realm, but it's not completely divorced from reality, which gives this narrative its power. For example, you may remember in May 2012, the Obama administration released what I, I, I've long maintained is a lamentably ridiculous small amount of documents that were seized from bin Laden's hideout in Abbottabad, Pakistan. In fact, out of tens of thousands, and that may even be a modest, uh, a modest estimate, out of tens of thousands of documents, maybe even hundreds of thousands, they chose to release highly selectively only 17 documents. Even within that thimbleful, that very modest sample, there was one document that I thought, a memo in fact, that Bin Laden himself had written in 2004 that I thought was absolutely fascinating, in fact was riveting. In 2004, Bin Laden sends a memo to his aides and says, Nigeria is a place that's fertile for our expansion and growth. And of course, over the next four or five years, that's exactly what Al-Qaeda did. And the emergence of Boko Haram it spread from Nigeria to Cameroon, to Mali, to Mauritius, to countries surrounding Nigeria, has of course been one of the main security challenges in West Africa over the past uh, six years. So again, half-baked, but nonetheless with an important kernel of truth. Fourth, Al-Qaeda described the recovery phase, which was in the wake of bin Laden's killing and the elimination of its key leadership as a result of the drone program. And this was meant to run from 2010 to 2013, where Al-Qaeda's strategy was to exploit new opportunities created by the Arab Spring to gain toeholds in lawless, ungoverned border areas, to establish sanctuaries and safe havens and seam zones and other ungoverned spaces, and to turn those toeholds into footholds. And certainly that's what we've seen in Syria and again in Iraq. And then finally, they described nine years ago the fifth and final stage of their strategy, which was what they called the Declaration of the Caliphate stage, which was meant to last from 2013 to 2016. And this was to set the stage or pave the way for the ultimate goal and crowning achievement of Al-Qaeda, which was the restoration of the Caliphate and the recreation of supra or transnational Islamic rule from Andalus in Spain, across North Africa, through the Middle East, through the Caucasus, to South Asia, and to Southeast Asia. And this is the strategy, I would argue, that they still adhere to and swear by. In terms of how it's been translated into reality, we see how Al-Qaeda, in recent years, has sought to take over and control territory in Muslim lands. As I described a moment ago, to create toeholds that they could then transform into footholds, establishing physical sanctuaries and safe havens and new bases of operations. Second, once they felt themselves secure in these areas, was to declare emirates. Emirates that they believed would be safe from serious US and Western intervention. And even in the current manifestation of America's intervention in um, in Syria, Al-Qaeda and ISIS describe it as once again drawing the United States into struggles that it can only lose, at least in their estimate. Even if that's fantasy, nonetheless, actually Michael and my colleague, and I believe my friend, at least Mary Habeck, uh, also at the American Enter Enterprise Institute, a uh, graduate of Yale as well, someone who served on the national security staff uh, during the second Bush administration, has made, I think, the very important point that no peoples anywhere that has been subjugated, conquered, ruled over by Al-Qaeda or its affiliates and associates 
no matter how much they may have chafed under that rule, no matter how much they may have despised Al-Qaeda, has ever on their own been able to independently overthrow that rule and depose Al-Qaeda or its minions. It has always taken, she I think correctly argues, the intervention of the West to depose those powers. Uh, certainly in Afghanistan and Iraq in the last decade, more recently as a result of the French intervention in Mali, and now of course with the United States and Western intervention in Iraq and Syria. And thirdly, the third imperative is to continue to establish bases from which to, in my estimation, from which to pursue opportunities to attack the United States in the West, to wage operations further afield than these local or parochial struggles. Now, a few years ago, those bases were largely confined to three countries alone, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Yemen, where we were working, struggling to roll back the tide of jihadism there. I think alarmingly, over the past two years, even those potential bases of operation have more than doubled. They still remain Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Yemen, but they've expanded to Syria, Iraq, potentially North Africa, and astonishingly, even Turkey, a close NATO ally, where if you just read the front page of the New York Times today, um, there are any number of ISIS cells and operatives active throughout cities in eastern Turkey. In terms of threats to the United States and to our Western allies, I think there's unfortunately um, a list of concerns. In the aftermath of the tragedy in Boston a year and a half, a year and a half ago, uh, many people talked about our resiliency. In fact, there was a, a front page article a month later in the Washington Post that described how America was changed from 9-11, how it was much more resilient, much more confident, and much less fearful of terrorists. And I have to say, I, I seriously questioned those arguments in that article. Three people tragically died in Boston, but three people is a world's difference between 3,000 being killed within 102 minutes of one another. And I think for our adversaries throughout the world, we may want to pat ourselves in the back and see Boston as manifesting resilience and determination. But unfortunately, I think our enemies see it differently. They see how two idiots, basically, a teenager and his slightly older brother, were able to paralyze an entire American city, shut down the entire city of Boston and, and its suburbs, close down Logan Airport, and they sit there now and wonder that if a teenager and a slightly older brother with no training can achieve that, what could more professional terrorists attain themselves? So here we have the problem that, of course, if you've watched uh, 60 Minutes in recent weeks and seen FBI Director James Comey, he's identified as one of the main challenges we face and that many of our allies face, and that's the return of foreign fighters to their homelands, whether adopted or otherwise whether operating as part of terrorist soul, um, cells or emerging as lone wolves, carrying out operations completely on their own, but nonetheless motivated, inspired, and animated by te existing terrorist organizations. We already see the consequences of preventing would-be or aspirational foreign fighters from departing their homelands to fight elsewhere. And this goes back to my point about how fluid this environment is and how complex the challenges are today. Just a few months ago, many of our allies in Australia, the United Kingdom, and Canada thought it was a tremendous uh, step forward by seizing these individuals' passports and preventing them from going overseas that they had blunted this particular threat. Yet in Australia, on September 18th, uh, both the New South Wales Police in Sydney and the Victorian Police in Melbourne arrested a total of 15 individuals whose passports had been taken, who had, prevented, who had been prevented from going to Syria to fight, and rather than giving up the struggle, had heeded exactly the propaganda being issued by ISIS today to strike out at ISIS's enemies, at Jihad's enemies in the West, and undertake terrorist acts on their own. And these 15 persons were arrested and they were charged with plotting to kidnap ordinary Australians and behead them. On the 8th of October, in the United Kingdom, British police arrested five individuals associated with ISIS who were charged with plotting, and the details of this still haven't been revealed, a quote unquote significant attack. And then of course we have the events of the past week in Canada, 
uh, both the terrible killing of a Canadian soldier walking uh, beside the road uh, with an automobile, and also then last week's attack on Parliament, again by individuals who were, whose passports were seized or who were not issued passports in hopes of preventing them from crossing the border. In this sense, many of our political leaders repeatedly focus on Mexico and on the southern border as being a threat. Yet in this context, we may face a greater threat from Canada, as the Canadian authorities are completely aware. In fact, Canada thus far has produced more foreign fighters, more Canadians have gone to fight with Al-Qaeda and with ISIS and the Levant than have left the United States. And one thinks that Canada's population is exponentially smaller than the United States. This is a problem that the Canadian authorities are currently grappling with. So what we see, at least in the near future, I think, are at least six potential categories of attacks that potentially could emanate from the Middle East and that are arguably within terrorist grasp today. First and foremost, lone wolf attacks or other attacks perpetrated by returned or frustrated foreign fighters randomly targeting individuals. We might also see the embrace of July 7, 2005 type suicide bomb attacks on mass transit. The attacks on London mass transit in 2005 uh, were not completely isolated. Three years later, an identical plot was foiled in Barcelona, Spain, that involved suicide attackers attempting to attack that country's mass transit. And of course, in 2009, an individual named uh, Najibul Azazi, trained by Al-Qaeda, was dispatched to the United States to attempt a copycat attack against the New York City subway system. We might also conceivably see, potentially in Europe, um, elsewhere, conventional bomb attacks against mass transit, such as the attacks uh, that occurred in Madrid in March 2004, and then were repeated, for instance, in Mumbai in 2006. We might see the spread of Mumbai-style attacks, or attacks such as the one that Al-Shabaab mounted a year and a half ago against the Westgate Mall in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. This would conform to one of bin Laden's edicts. And as I said, whether ISIS or Al-Qaeda still revere bin Laden and still follow his path. As you may recall, in 2010, bin Laden called on his followers to stage Mumbai-style attacks throughout European capitals. At that time, at that particular era, there was no one to answer the call. There weren't the individuals with the training, with the access to European cities to do so. Unfortunately, with the ferment, with the upheaval, with the ongoing conflicts in Syria, one near, merely has to cross the border into Turkey, drive into the European Union, and then within hours be at a city to carry out the attacks. The possibility of chemical attacks, I think, has grown larger than at any other time in recent history. Uh, just recently, in fact, there was an attack perpetrated against Iraqi security forces involving chlorine gas. But more worrisome, last year, within a week of one another, in Turkey, Turkish authorities arrested members of Al-Qaeda who were in the process of planning and were extremely far along in the implementation of a terrorist attack outside of Turkey involving sarin nerve gas. Sarin nerve gas, of, of course, was the... Uh, was the chemical weapon that was used in the 1995 attack on the Tokyo subway by a religious cult, the Om Shinrikyo. A week later, authorities in Baghdad arrested a cell of ISIS terrorists that were similarly in the process of developing sarin nerve gas to use in that country, but meanwhile had already perfected uh, chlorine, nerve, uh, chlorine um, a poison gas, which as we've seen has just been used uh, in the past week. Um, we see the perennial obsession that the jihadis have with commercial aviation having resulted this past summer in yet another circular issued by the Transportation Security Administration about the danger of non-metallic bombs being smuggled onto aircraft. And finally, we saw not this summer, but the summer before in 2013, how the terrorist obsession with attacking U.S. diplomatic targets throughout the world remains prominent when 23 U.S. embassies and consulates were forced to close in August 2013 because of a variety of threats. All right, let me conclude. Uh, what should we do about it? Firstly, and the obvious one, is that we need to proactively contain al-Qaeda 
and ISIS's geographical expansion. Fortunately, we're starting to do that. But until recently, that was something that was occurring unimpeded. We need also to fight against the resurrection of Al-Qaeda's capabilities, as it's attempting to do in South Asia and elsewhere, and to roll back the consolidation of ISIS's rule and control over the territory it's already seized in Iraq. In order to achieve this, I would argue, at least the US intelligence community needs better horizon scanning capabilities. In other words, capabilities to identify emerging groups better and faster than at least over the past year they've proved able to do. But I think we also need to conceptualize the threat differently. Too often over the past 13 years, we've looked at the Al-Qaeda problem specifically through the lens of individual countries and mostly operated in a bilateral fashion. We need to look at the Al-Qaeda and indeed the ISIS threats as regional ones, one that spread from locales to become regional problems and stop them before they become international ones. In this sense, I think we need a renewed focus on the so-called seam zones or law lawless border areas and ungoverned spaces that Al-Qaeda and ISIS have sought, to turn in, have sought to turn into footholds and to project power elsewhere. We need a regional security approach that will improve security and border controls and focus on the pressure points, financially, geographic, and physical, that sustain the movement of fighters and finances across nation states. We need to continue to focus on the four countries closest to Al-Qaeda's revival, and in some instances, ISIS's emergence, with whom we have varying degrees of leverage. This includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and especially Turkey. We need to have, maintain a residual presence of US forces overseas to train and to support local allies, building up their military and police forces, providing the backbone for quick reaction forces, and also to build up and strengthen border forces as well. We need to counter the terrorist use of social media much more effectively than we've done in the past. I mean, it's remarkable. Many of these apps were invented in this country, were invented and created in Silicon Valley. Yet we're always beyond the, behind the curve. We're always responding to the terrorist embrace and exploitation of this media and attempting to counter it once it's taken hold. We need a better ability in the US government to look ahead at the next new thing, next new thing in technology to anticipate how terrorists will use these emerging applications and social media that are just coming on the market in the next six to 12 months and develop the means ahead of time proactively to counter their use. We need also to embrace a more sober depiction and discussion of a threat that after all is generational. That won't be confined to an end just because we declare there's collapse, strategic collapse or victory. And in this sense, I think we have to start, stop making artificial distinctions and offering bromides about Al-Qaeda and see the struggle to its end. As I wrote in the last two sentences of the book, which I finished last year, which unfortunately I think remain true today, the final battle against Al-Qaeda has not been fought, nor has the final chapter in the war on terrorism been written. Thank you very much. So two questions, one about whether ISIS might uh, pursue or try and seek a nuclear weapon, and secondly, uh, to about China's role in what's going on. I, I think, fortunately for the moment, that's probably one threat uh, we don't have to deal with uh, in terms of ISIS's acquisition of a nuclear weapon. Um, I think you know, the danger such as it exists is much more in South Asia as well, which may play into al-Qaeda's strategy in building up its South Asian uh, base because Firstly, at least to my knowledge, uh, no outside power has ever inspected Pakistan's nuclear arsenal or facilities and can be assured, we just have to take it on their say-so, that and be assured that they're adequately protected. One hopes there is, but we also know that Pakistan on a regular basis moves its nuclear weapons around uh, to avoid having a static nuclear force that could be targeted by India, for example, or that, you know, first strike capability, or that at least would give the United States an idea where those weapons are located. And of course, 
valuable commodities like that are at greater risk in transit. Um, but I would say the danger, as I described, is, is more these groups using fairly crude chemical weapons that even then, I would argue, would be used more for their psychological impact, that they would have a profoundly destabilizing and unsettling effect on, certainly on local and regional security, perhaps even international security, as the Tokyo attacks did in 1995. Um, even less so, I think they understand that in order to kill people, you know, slitting throats, shooting them, suicide bombers is much more effective than these more exotic weapons, that these exotic weapons, at least in the terrorist context of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, one hopes are just, you know, more effective for their psychological impact. Can the U.S. have a successful strategy versus ISIS in the absence of ground forces? No, but I think um, if we deploy ground forces, the likelihood is that they'd be deployed and used very differently and in smaller numbers than we saw at any time over the past 13 years. I think that's, you know, it, it's impossible. You know, the proponents of air power have always promised that they could deliver victories in warfare, uh, you know, without forces on the ground, and that's always, you know, proved an illusory dream. And I think we're going to get to a point, especially with ISIS, where without having the in intelligence coming from either special operations forces as target designators or else as uh, both special, fo special for operations forces and intelligence assets providing that information, we're going to find that the number of targets becomes uh, you know, in increasingly scarce. So I think there will have to be some ground forces. The question is, can we you know, utilize our special operations capability in a smarter way and prevent the large footprint of the past? Can we train up our allies in these regions fast enough? I mean, I think that's one of the main challenges and one of the main problems. That was actually a problem in Mali that prompted the French intervention a couple of years ago, is that the United States Special Operations Forces were there training their Malian counterparts, but not fast enough. Unfortunately, the Boko Haram and the threat from AQIM and the threat from various other splinters was growing faster than we can train them. And I think we face a, a pretty steep climb in Iraq as well. So I think General Dempsey was actually offering some truth uh, by saying that if we're really serious about, I'm not sure we can necessarily, you know, defeat, defeating in terrorism is also a notoriously slippery term. I think our goal should really be to suppress them and to beat down the threat to much more manageable proportions. And then once we've achieved that goal, we can then think about actually defeating them. But that's going to take, firstly, a long struggle, um, and secondly, it's not going to be one as we can see. Especially, I mean, the number of air sorties that are being flown on a daily basis are also you know, significantly lower than, for instance, in the Balkans almost 20 years ago, certainly during the Iraq War. So air power alone isn't going to provide a solution to this. Should the U.S. pay ransom to get hostages back? Well, you know, we should, I think we should always be tough on the terrorists and not tough on the hostages. Um, actually, uh, you know, I, it's unpopular to say, I think they're going to seize Americans and Britons in any event, that not paying ransom doesn't stop them. It merely con, uh, consigns our citizens to these, these horrible, uh, her, uh, tragic deaths. Um, I know... Uh, certainly when I served in Iraq with the Coalition Provisional Authority in 2004 and spent most of my time outside of the green zone and the red zone, I didn't expect that I, if I would, and we were always being followed, in fact, um, and, and tracked. So that problem was, and certainly, um, you know, much as Dr. Rubin described that, you know, uh, Muslim against Muslim violence being greater, I mean, there were already, you know, large numbers of Iraqi citizens being kidnapped and ransomed if the ransoms weren't paid being killed. But I remember thinking I was there on government service. I would have at least hoped that if I was taking hostage, I wouldn't be consigned to that sort of fate. So I actually think that we have to revive. I'm, I don't think there should be absolutes in this, but that we need the flexibility. And sort of saying that we're not going to pay ransoms isn't going to stop our enemies from seizing Americans or Britons. What are the dangers about engaging Iran, uh, the U.S. engaging Iran in the fight with ISIS? Uh, I think we have to use our own resources and use the allies that we can really trust in the region. I mean, Dr. Pressman had talked about the Jordanians, among others. Uh, certainly work to bring the Turks around. After all, they are a NATO partner. But I, as I said, I think it's a fool's errand, though, to think that, that there can be any positive, anything positive that can come out of cooperation with Iran. Underlying this whole thread 
is you're doing a strategic analysis and you're pointing out about incoherency in terms of policy and response. So my question is, how do you rate how well the West, the administration, State Department's doing, and what is your prognosis for this? I don't think we or the West have a strategy to counter terrorism. I mean, look at our attitude compared to Israel. Does Israel talk about Hamas or Hezbollah being on the, repeatedly being on the verge of strategic collapse? Does Israel talk about an end to the war on terror? They realize that this is firstly the neighborhood they live in, that unfortunately that neighborhood came to the United States on September 11, 2001. They realize, secondly, this isn't a war that's like a, tra a traditional conflict that has a surrender on a battleship and then some instrument of peace and then you, know, you, rebuild, you go back and you rebuild societies. They see this as a perpetual condition of the end of the 20th century and of the 21st century. And that's, I don't think, what the United States and the West has yet come around to. We declare victory precipitously. We attach artificial endpoints to movements that are, firstly, enormously determined that are enormously resilient, that I would argue, and Dr. Rubin used the analogy of uh, Bob Pape's work, I mean, I think it is about religion and ideology. That is what sustains this and makes it, makes it so different. Uh, unfortunately, as the Taliban has often said, you know, we have the watches and they have the time. I think that's very much how our enemies view the West. I mean, even Bin Laden never ever claimed that he would defeat the United States militarily on the battlefield. He knew that was an impossibility, but what he said in his, at least his last publicly videotaped message, which is nearly 10 years ago, it was almost exactly, it was October 30th, uh, 2004, he said that he was going to bankrupt us. And he quoted the fact that, you know, all you have to do is wave a jihadi flag anywhere and then Western forces intervene. So this is part of their strategy of innervation. And I think we don't, often we don't have a strategy. We use tactics that we interpret as strategic. For instance, the drone campaign, I think was a very effective tactic, but we overreached, assessed it as being a strategic solution to the Al-Qaeda problem. It wasn't. It was, again, going back to the Israeli analogy, it wasn't what they call mowing the grass, weakening terrorist groups is not a strategic answer. It's pair, constantly attending and paring back the threat so it doesn't become overwhelming. Um, so we're impatient. We want solutions to problems. I think terrorism is something that isn't necessarily soluble. It's a condition of society that we have to beat down to the lowest level of subjection, but not think that it can ever be uh, defeated or eliminated. And we have to avoid, I think, stepping into the terrorist trap, which is that we lower our guard, they strike or they build up their resources. We have to then spin up to counter them, and we constantly exhaust ourselves undermine the morale of our forces that are told that we're on the verge of victory and in fact we're not. And also I think undermine confidence in our, in our leadership. That, that's why I ended my talk in saying that we have to realize that this is a generational struggle. Please join me in thanking Dr. Bruce Hoffman.